Oh, you're talking about in the census survey. In the census survey. And you go for the five years instead of one year. I think five years. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 So that's not too bad. Whereas five years actually Yeah. But not just that. Also, okay, maybe that's why it's a lot. Well, yeah. what that means is that that's why the one year is not as bad of an accuracy. Because they're, they're at least they're at least going out to these bigger cities, but you're, but, you're, but you're leaving out some information. Well, they have to Oh, yeah. I know, I know, I know. For <laughs> You know, it's like when you move to back home. So we see the same. And the Put some pants on. We're going to be wearing a swim dress every week, so I'm going to see some of our membership. Can you click? Is that hang up working fine? Yeah. Cool. All right. We have had the good fortune of working with um, some of the data science community on some of the things with the Big Data West Hub and, of course, Big Data Utah with uh, Nick Bagley. But um, we're taking a few new steps here with Alton Alexander that, of course, yours truly here is going to be presenting tonight. And we have an advanced data science series that's starting on the 19th. And then we're also going to have an introduction to data science that's going to be beginning in early November, leading into the um, data science big event that's going to be across the street. So we're going to try to reach into additional communities of those that may want to be able to tap into um, the data science community. And we appreciate you guys kind of helping network, see some familiar faces that have been here before with what we've done. And to uh, support the community that we're trying to establish here for big data and data science. It, what um, still looks to be the holodeck, but is now Access Salt Lake. If any of you are in a need for an office space for like just hot desking or something downtown, you can just go to um, accesssaltlake.com and there's a little registration area up above. And if you register there, we're having free flex desk October. You actually have some members here that I won't put them on the spot, that I think they're pretty happy with um, what's going on here. But I just wanted to welcome the data community I'm welcoming you tonight for the seven steps program that you're doing. Yep, something like that. Yep. And um, as you all probably know, you're in very good hands with Colton Alexander. So um, let your friends know that are in the data community they missed out tonight, but they're going to have the opportunity for four advanced courses coming up starting on the you know, 19th. And it's um, attached to the same event, right? That was for this as well. And uh, for uh, beginning classes. And we welcome you to Access Salt Lake. I've obviously talked too much. Enjoy the food. Enjoy the uh, messaging and enjoy your extremely uh, capable and uh, competent presenter. And with that, Alton Alexander. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Joel, for hosting us and for Access Salt Lake and for your you. Uh, so, uh, this is going to be a pretty low key thing. Uh, a little bit about us. Uh, Front Analytics is my consulting practice. Um, we uh, officially founded this year and now. Have several clients, especially here in the Utah Valley, and we work heavily with contractors. And um, it's kind of an exciting time for growing, and we're um, excited to take on new projects as well as kind of showcase what we do do. But a lot of what we have done, and our specialty really is to white label um, our services, and we come in and provide such a key value add for uh, companies that it's. Um, not really fair for us to give a lot of details, but uh, at opportunities like this, we can speak across our portfolio and really uh, give you a sense of uh, the way that we approach problems and uh, kind of that breadth of view that we have across uh, different clients. So uh, I'll be happy to take your questions as we go through, but uh, um, 
for starters, we're going to go through these steps today. The other side. So if you go back a slide, <coughs> now two slides. Now one more slide back. There we go. Okay. All right. This is a crucial slide. So this is step number one. When we approach a problem in a data science problem, we make sure that our clients understand that um, there needs to be a goal in mind, right? And um, by goal, hey, let's go. By goal, um, I find that there's a lot of parallelism in journalism, really. And uh, so when a journalist takes on a project, I take, for example, Tom Post. He's one of the world-recognized corporate journalists. And when it comes to corporate journalism, it's not like there's a lot of exciting things to talk about, right? I mean, it's business. And his goal is just to keep the good things top of mind and sharing those. And he has said these three things. That you need to have an idea about your story, about what you want to, you know, what I solve before you even start the interviews or any of the process, right? And getting to the data. The whole objective also is to provide value. And he reiterates that everything is about storytelling. Right? And so I wanted to just emphasize this is kind of the first point. And if we go to the next slide, um, what I'd like to share here is that the goal isn't just to play with fancy new technology. Right. Um, really, um, while technology is going to be incorporated at every step and every level of the analytics, um, everywhere from inference, you know, down to actual infrastructure at the bottom, um, that's not like the goal, right? Just like you know, this funny quote down here: Elon Musk, um, uh, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact, right? It's <laughs> like, like we're we're. It's fun and exciting to be in this space, but um, but that's not the point. It's just to play with fancy data, right? We need to remember that we're there to tell that story and to provide the value. So the next slide. So what are good goals? Uh, one more. Um, a good example of a good goal is one: uh, if it increases clarity, right? So this is uh, inferring the essentials from an onslaught of data, right? It's distilling down information from when you've got so much on your plate, what's the underlying data trying to say, or what's the story? <clears throat> and or third, another example is uh, delivering actionable. So at the end of the day, it's not just um, what what's going on, but what do I need to do? What are the levers that I can pull that, um, you know, that cause a given action or an outcome? And then again, I just reiterate that uh, our emphasis is always to add value, right? That the numbers themselves aren't the insight. Um, it's an ends to a means. It's telling the story. Cool. So that's step one for us. So step two is when we go into a company, we need to uh, assess the skills. Part of this includes understanding our own skills, but um, but it, it also comes down to assessing the individuals on the teams and the skills that they have, but also the company at large and what kind of skills and what, what level they're at. Because organizations kind of take on their own personality as well, right? And um, and sometimes they're a little bit defective, right? They're the you know the awkward set But they're ultimately, you know, they're they're functioning and uh, there's opportunity there. So I wanted to highlight some of the skills that we look for that are more universal. If you go through these, then. we have uh, I look for this hacker behavior, that kind of like, oh, we can solve that, but I might, I don't exactly know what the standard, like, uh, you know, ABC is that I'm supposed to do, but we're going to get there. Um, I also look for grit. Grit is when there is, in the face of uncertainty, these are the people who persevere, right? And they, they, they when other people give up at the 11th hour, these are the people who just keep going. I also look for self-awareness, both at the, at the organizational level, right, and then at the individual level, because I want to make sure that um, it, it's a really unique skill to know what you do know and to know what you don't know. And uh, self-awareness is a big key in you know, part of that. And then a couple others are an aversion to distractions. Um, this is kind of like, oh, hey, there's a squirrel, right? Like, just because there's a shiny new technology um, and and while that can be motivating, that also can derail you from accomplishing 
the number one objective, right? Which is telling the story, adding the value, and, and delivering. Um, and then also this drive to work better um, and not necessarily be satisfied with the status quo. These are these are traits and skills that I like to assess um, when I go into a data science project or anything. Really. So regarding knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, so this is a quick little plug for contract workers, right? Uh, and if you're not already in this book, um, you wouldn't go um, cut your own hair, would you? And uh, and maybe you would, which is totally fine, <laughs> because some people do that, and and that's great. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm one of them. But the thing is, that <laughs> if you do cut your own hair, tell me this: who are you going to go to learn uh, to cut your own hair from? Right? You're not going to go talk to your barber, uh, and or or somebody. Uh, even worse, somebody who never cuts hair, right? Um, but uh, but instead, you would want to go talk to somebody who cuts their own hair, right? Somebody who like is down that path, you know, who who is in the weeds. And I think that this applies when it comes to knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, relying on uh, contractors and consultants because of the experience that they can provide across the breadth of companies and some exposure to other industries or. Um, or, or, you know, where the problems are solved. Okay, step number three. Now we're getting into the actual data science work, and, and uh, there's, there's going to be some things that hopefully you can take from this. Assessing the data. We all know that in the, 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 you know, the data deliverable pipeline that we have to go through these steps, collecting, storing, transforming, uh, modeling, predicting, and then ultimately presenting the results. And, uh, and you can see that I'm kind of deviating from those steps a little bit. But... That upfront part, that part that I have circled there, this assessing the data in the exploratory piece, the really like connecting the dots between what is business trying to solve and um, the business processes they have in place. How's that represented in the data? And then how's it stored, collected, transformed so that it can be modified and munched in anticipation for the end results, right? And so a lot of what we do too is, um, our first engagement will typically be a feasibility study where we will work with them, with our clients, to address um, can the questions that they're trying to ask even be solved given the data that they have or the data that we can help them collect. Um, because sometimes it can't, they, you know, it, the data's not there or um, it, it's just, it's not a data problem. So, you know, there's other types of problems in business. Um, but this is such a key piece, if you go to the next slide, that, um, that we call this whole entire piece data engineering, right? And it encompasses ETL and so forth. And it's so important for us that, like Joel mentioned, we are kicking off a two-week short course where our only goal is to teach exactly what skills we want to hire for. Uh, this course, we're, we're setting up for $480 just so that you understand what the value is, but I want you to know that we're uh, offering scholarships um, um, because it's so important to us that we, uh, uh, we find and skill up those individuals for the jobs that we see and the jobs that we need. My quick plug there. Okay, on the next slide, oh, it's hot back one. No, 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 I'm going. I think you can go down to the bottom too. Just click right over here. Yeah. Get back one more. Okay, I wanted to give you this case study, right? Uh, even though this is high level, um, this is one of uh, the more exciting projects that we worked on. There's times when data science consulting company. Um, a lot of the core value that we provide is in that, uh, you know, applying algorithms and and then ultimately telling or implementing those algorithms. But sometimes there's a lot of value just to cleaning up data. So in this case study, in this example, what we did was their need was that they had a loss of data integrity in the warehouse. Um, this happens all the time, especially in data lakes. Now that now the data lakes are a couple years old. You see stuff that's just crammed in there, and people don't know how it's linked, or why it was in there, or if it's even relevant, or you know who maintains it, how does it. But there is some trail of um, 
of uh, you know metadata about who it belongs to and what it is. And for this case, the end goal was um, to to create a view and connect all the disparate pieces just to make sure that they understood we understood that starting point. This is kind of like the feasibility step. And uh, so to accomplish that goal, what we did was we sampled uh, much of their data, uh, at, at least to get a, a, the breadth and the view um, of each of the tables, <coughs> and you know, in multiple databases. And then uh, using stochastic joins, uh, we were able to say that this ID looks a lot like this ID, even though they're totally different names, and then uh, propose that they get paired together. In that, you can basically reverse engineer the um, the table structure, right? Uh, without explicitly knowing, um, um, you know, the, the relationships. And that we did it. So, okay, so next slide. So what is step four? Step four is we have to assess the uh, resources. And, uh, and it's kind of a shame that I have to plug this in, but uh, sometimes, um, you know, we have to make sure that our that we're being realistic here, that what they want to solve is is even feasible with the, uh, the kind of resources that they can invest into this, this particular type of project. But we also like to take a pulse of, um, of where they've invested money so far and kind of what um, what their take is on different key aspects. So that includes everything from are they an enterprise, kind of old school, uh, uh, I guess you can go old school now. You know, at Oracle or Microsoft Shop, or are they really into the open source, the Spark, and, and the Hoot? And even though those worlds have certainly collided and, um, and it's overlapping a lot, but sometimes can be an issue. Um, and then, you know, simple things like it, are they in our shop versus Python or Excel? Like, well, we work in, you know, at, at all levels, that's, uh, it's good to get that pulse. And then, uh, and then, for example, cloud versus on-premise. And I wanted to I put these keys here, actually, to remind me of a story that I'm going to tell you guys. And feel free to interrupt any time there are questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, take questions. But some companies, um, when I assess their, you know, when me, when I or my teammates go in and assess their, um, their situation, sometimes we're faced with a lot of bureaucratic accessibility. And, uh, and I think that happens also when in that choice between should we move to the cloud or is this, you know, is the cloud even safe or whatever. But, um, but I also see this all the time when, um, for example, if we don't have the ability to um, view or modify uh, AWS, for example, or, or to be able to work with their sysadmins to, to uh, you know, set up um, some of the tools that are readily available if they're an AWS shop, right? Um, or if they're IBM or, or Microsoft Azure, right? It's very similar in the sense that sometimes there's a gatekeeper and we can't even, like, like we don't even have the ability to very easily uh, or very rapidly work through the processes to set up the environments that we need to. And, uh, and part of that's just getting a sense of what the organization's like, right? And, and who the key players are and where we fit into that. So that's assessing the resources. And let me tell you more about resources. Yeah, on the next slide. Um, we are very pragmatic. Uh, that's, that's just our nature. That's who I am. I, I, I'm a, I like to think I'm a simple kind of person. And uh, I proposed this, this must-read article by uh, Dan McKinley, where he says, he basically makes this case for choosing boring technology, right? Because um, in business, uh, it is so exciting to get caught up in like the next shiny thing, um, and but he proposes some of these reasons why. Um, part of it is uh, business processes are already complex enough, and here you want to go try to add like a brand new technology where maybe there's not a lot of um, you know documentation or there's still evolving best practices in that environment. Um, so therefore, he says embrace simplicity and boredom, right? Like, if it's something that you could do with a shell script in, in uh, Perl, then uh, maybe that's good enough, you know? Um, he also mentions optimizing globally, and I'll, I'll explain what that actually means a little bit, according to him. And then uh, he does say choose new technology sometimes. And a perfect example is, um, 
is that I can find you a, a PHP developer for like half the cost of a Ruby on Rails book. That might not be the same anymore because a bunch of people jumped on Ruby on Rails bandwagon right now. They have all those, those uh, boot camps, which um, have been wildly successful in my opinion, but, they, um, but they've kind of flooded a, a market space. Um, but that's another good example where, right, there's just some technologies that it's just easier to find help, and if it gets the same job done, then, then maybe that's okay. Because at the end of the day, just remember step one, right? We're just delivering value, and we just have to ship. Uh, did you, are you okay if they have questions? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Uh, so where do, you, where do you draw the line between what is simple and what is not so simple? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, actually a part of, and obviously it's from the perspective of the customer, right? Yeah, the company, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's actually part of optimizing globally because there's more factors at play than just like, you know, is this programming language easier and cheaper to implement than this programming language? Um, and let me show you what that looks like actually on the next slide. Okay. And I'll, I have to kind of go from memory, but I'll go back one. So my is jumping. Okay, let me try to remember this. I can spend a few months now. Okay, so if you imagine this is the space of all your business problems, okay? And in an ideal, ideal world, um, you would want to pick the exact technical solution that matches that problem, right? Because there are technical solutions, right? Like, um, say your problem is I need to have uh, real-time operations reporting for uh, my manufacturing floor to make decisions you know, in the moment about uh, what they're doing. And the, maybe the best technology is, you know, X Y Z, right? Or you know, maybe I've got a problem where I need to um, display dashboards, or I need to, um, you, you know, you can think of your business problems, and that would be ideal. And in fact, in some ways, that might even be, um, like he says here, uh, in a world where choices are cheap, right? Where it's it's cheap to basically pick any of these and maintain all. Of them. But the way you choose technology in a world where operations are a serious concern, meaning reality, in the fact that like, you know, maybe it's difficult to hire for certain skills, or maybe it's difficult to spin up, you know, and, and rapidly move. You know, this is this is a perfect example of why they have uh, full stack um, JavaScript. Uh, uh, this isn't even open space, but this came to mind. JavaScript. Um, like web frameworks, right? Because then you can your back ends in JavaScript, your front ends in JavaScript, right? And and everything in between. And uh, and that can be powerful. Because uh, then you don't have to keep switching. Um, but in our world, maybe that means something like um, you know, are we are we using Spark and like overusing it, maybe in other spaces where where a, a different option could be available. Um, I mean that's part of the part of what Try to solve. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. So this is what uh, this is part of what we propose when we work with your businesses at this step um, for solving your resources. I wanted to give another plug too to um, a documentation that I put together about a month ago. This is a, a download that you can go get if you go to this URL. It's a 20-page guide, and this actually. It includes, you know, how I set up my standalone Spark guide. Uh, it has like how I use commodity hardware. Um, like I got a hold of five uh, laptops and just kind of chat with them. This is like this is getting real with uh, with hardware if you're dumb, right? Or similarly, I have uh, I have details on how you can spin it up for yourself. How I personally chose my laptop. How we set up VPNs. And configure the routing and firewalls. But most importantly, on the next slide, um, this is the fundamental guide and what I look for when I talk about the resources that a company has because it kind of fits into this space. This is my main laptop and, and the clients, right? This is where um, where the fingers kind of touch the data. But um, what I look for is my clients and companies that are in big data and and are serious about machine learning and will benefit from our services uh, do a lot of machine learning on their laptops, right? Beyond like uh, getting it to work, you know. 
Um, but the environment looks more or less like this, where they have one or more clusters, and a cluster is basically a Hadoop master. Uh, Hadoop meaning, I, I'm just generalizing the, uh, that paradigm. And then um, uh, distributed computing and distributed storage. And then they have uh, multiple data nodes, uh, usually more than four. But, uh, and then within this ecosystem, there's a normally a, a few, or at least one fairly beefy private server, which would have something like uh, lots of RAM, and in our case, R or Python. And then you would have like a public server, which would be your kind of reporting environment where, while it may not be public to the world, it's public in the sense that, um, that that's kind of your uh, dashboarding layer, right? You maybe think tablet server or Spark server. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you can download those details. So let's go to the next step. Step five. Use a scientific method and one more button. So this is just step five. It's like just use a scientific method. I don't know um, what else there is to say about that. If you're a data scientist, then shouldn't you be? You know, following scientific practices. And if you forgot what it is, I have this funny comic, which is you identify a problem and then you form a hypothesis, right? You have to kind of think uh, A B scenario, like what, what are of the infinite choices that there could be, let's start with that, right? And I think that it's this, or I think this could work, or I think that we can, uh, you know, add value by uh, clustering our customers in this way, right? You make observations, and then you get down into this this cycle, right? Where where um, where I propose that as a consulting company, we cut down on those cycles because of our experience and and breadth of knowledge, but uh, but ultimately draw conclusions and uh, communicate the results. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, so given that. The next step is just use magic. Right? Uh, I put this in just because. Uh, sure, yeah, we we actually do. We have to do machine learning, right? We have to do the, that senior sauce. Today's magic, right, kind of goes by the name of uh, deep learning, and um, and it is powerful, right? But it's knowing when to use these and um, and uh, how to tune them and uh, how to prepare the data, right, to get them in. But I also include this article that you can peruse on your own time if you didn't see it already. Why being a data scientist feels like a magician because I actually often get that response that people are kind of dumbfounded when when you do like some NLP work and they're like, holy cow, how did you you know generate these topics? Because these are so right. And it's just an algorithm. Okay, so uh, so let me show you some case studies on the next slide. Um, some more high-level case studies that go with that. Okay, this is uh, this happened to be a dental SaaS solution. So they have a product where they you know sell their software to dentists, and um, and they have a reoccurring um, you know subscription basis. And part of the school was uh, uh, for this short project. How do we anticipate the needs of individual dentist dental practices, right? So that we can market to those individuals, so that we can prevent them from uh, turning, right, and canceling this subscription, or how can we implement features into our product so that they can be better served, right, uh, among all the different features that we possibly could implement, you know, what are the ones that, that make no sense, and especially across individuals. And so to do this, we used, uh, of course, ETL and a lot of data engineering. This, this company uh, benefited greatly from, uh, I mean, systems just get messy, right, that's just the nature of it especially siloed companies, and pulling it all together and then doing a, um, an unsupervised customer segmentation. And and then most importantly, after segmenting, um, interpreting results, right? And saying, who is this cluster, right? What makes them unique from the others? And overlaying that with, for example, things like survey results to say, um, what is this cluster asking about, you know? And that's the stuff that the executives just Pay for them, really, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me also tell you this one, um, the more recent one, kind of a shortish one too. We, um, we see this problem a lot. It's called entity resolution. Um, it's, it's a super fun problem to work on. And uh, in this case, it's an inbound nurture call center. So in the call center, there's people who are calling in. 
uh, uh, healthcare call center. Uh, people are calling in and uh, asking questions about their health code. And, um, and as quickly as possible, we want the system behind the scenes to identify um, who the customer is with, with high probability um, so that they can verify and correctly link uh, information and basically pick up from where they left off, right? This is kind of like you calling your, your insurance company, right? Uh, nowadays, you don't necessarily get all the same agent every time you call Geico, for example, right? Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, to add value to the customer and then also to, uh, you know, shorten their, their uh, SLAs or their, you know, the time on the call, we can add technology. And to do this, uh, it's, it's a fun problem in the sense that you have to take all, uh, uh, you have to take the user's input, basically, um, or all the users that you're looking uh, might be the people that you're looking for, and then you cross that and uh, an outer joint all the possible people that it could have been, right, onto each record, and uh, so it, it expands, right? Uh, and then, uh, and so that's a fun problem, right? Is this this problem you're trying to solve? Either we just join by using like either phone number or social security number or you can, yes. You then can. that yes. is unique it, and then exactly. All right, okay. Exactly. So there are some times where there is like a unique key, especially okay. and, and that's why they'll ask you, you know, for those things. Okay. Uh, in this case, they were actually trying to match households. Okay. Across and, and it was an offline process at first. And so they wanted to uh, they wanted to basically say of all these calls even though they came from you know, the same phone number or maybe from different phone numbers, like cell phones, um, um, and maybe they had different names, but they had the same address, or maybe the, the agent typed in the wrong address, but it's the same name and the same phone number, you know, and, and kind of that deduping process to say, here is the, uh, uh, you know, here are the users, right? Um, and basically that comes down to, you know, matching all of them and then, and then applying some some uh, Levenstein or some distance between the two records and then setting a threshold, right? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, cool, great questions. So step seven, this is kind of the final step, but um, in delivering a successful data science project, we um, can't undervalue enough the importance of executive level presentation. So um, if you can, if you can imagine in your mind working your way backwards, executive level presentation is like the icing on top, but it's almost even more than that because if you don't deliver the, um, you know, this presentation in a way that's interpretable, um, you actually don't extract any of the value out of the, the machine learning because it, it's all kind of mute. You know, there's no uh, unless you have somebody there to deliver and say like, you know, here's how much value we provided. Uh, then that kind of disappears. And similarly, if you can't, you know, execute on the machine learning and on the, um, the presentation layer, then all that work that you did on ETL, or all the work that you did on kind of data cleansing and kind of, you know, bring it into a data lake, like it's, it's not for the value. Yeah. So that's why this is so important for us. And part of why um, um, we're kicking off that advanced course, not just for data engineering, but this last piece too, to make sure that um, we're teaching and inspiring um, people that we want to have work with us and for us, ultimately. I mean, they might choose to work anywhere else, but um, but these people, uh, we want to make sure they have good storytelling skills. So, uh, just another question here. How long does the project normally take from the start to the, the end, and, and the reason why I'm asking is because if it's a long project, yeah. do you find yourself needing to frequently interact with the executives so that they can kind of see where you're going, or is it short sure. enough that you can just deliver it a week yes. or two later? No, exactly. Actually, it, it ends up being very cyclical, and we do uh, multiple iterations. But um, given the state and the size of, that Front Analytics is in right now, we'd like to keep our Cycles shorter, and so we're kind of in the four week ish range, oh. um, and uh, and and that's why we like to do blitz. I mean, we really like to go over value, and then 
and then I anticipate in the future we'll we'll grow up and maybe something be more of like a you know half of what think it is or something. And uh, and take on, you know, grossly large projects that <laughs> never go anywhere. Really. <laughs> I, I don't know, actually I don't know the books, but um, I know that there's a lot of companies that spend millions of dollars on on very you know long cycles. I, I was just thinking that Obviously, if you have frequent communication, then it, then it, then it kind of gets them prepared, and you would also know where they're going to be when you're presenting this. The wow. exactly. Yeah, so that's and they can extract some value along the way. That's right. Please digest it. Yeah. Okay, so let me um, tell you that uh, we call this data journalism, and there's uh, this is kind of a growing trend topic. Um, uh, I personally like to call it quantitative journalism. But the ultimate form of this is, is uh, of executive level storytelling is data journalism. And you see this when um, in, in articles, really. So to kind of break it down, executives, they get the PowerPoints, right? Um, your accountants and, and kind of uh, other data driven involved your financial side, they need uh, Excel. Uh, if you're working with uh, your an advertising team or your marketing team, they need kind of flash the present you know, uh, uh, plots um, uh, that sometimes are you know, cartoonish. And then, um, but ultimately, if it's the public, if it's the average consumer, and we almost have to sometimes treat everybody, even our executives, as the average consumer, they get articles, and articles are kind of like the, um, the ultimate form of uh, storytelling. Um, you know, I, short of video or in-person presentations. Um, and so I wanted just to share this example that I am seeing a lot more of these, and I don't know about you guys, but we see a lot of um, uh, news articles like this one that, uh, that came through on BBC about the Nobel Prize, why are Nobel Prize winners getting older? And like uh, two thirds of the article uh, talked about and referenced Multiple plots like this in in the, in the article, like for the average consumer, and uh, and that's kind of the level that we're at. That's uh, this, I see so much value in this in people who can translate the um, you know what's happening or what what was accomplished uh, into that that story that is either written or uh, presented to the executives. And I can't underestimate or underemphasize um, the value that this provides. Even though I'm a strong, strong like STEM believer, this is this is like the arts, you know, coming into play. And ultimately, I think our careers and our, um, you know, uh, we reach a level where it starts to become a little bit more of an art, anyways. Too. Um, this is just you know, really it's when I show you. Okay, so the next couple slides. So uh, so we're hiring. We. Uh, Data story topics ultimately. So, if you can take data sets and tell the story, that's really neat. Safety challenges and the shared system are probably real soon. So, next slide. Um, so, this is in summary. Yeah, on the next slide. Um, I want to just to include just a few other things for discussion point kind of what the internet say. Let's go through these real fast. Um, so kind of um, you see like a mess like this. Also, if you go back, um, just, yeah, go back to or, or was that? Oh yeah, okay, sorry, look forward. So this is just somebody saying, what are the six steps in data science? We have data acquisition, visualization, reporting, like lab, uh, uh, response automation, predictive analytics, and then decision optimization. Uh, that's kind of what we were saying before. Next slide. You see kind of big, huge, uh, you know. Trails like this. This is like becoming a data scientist, or you can imagine if you know if you want to accomplish a, a certain project. I know this is hard to see, but maybe this is like an NLP mining project. Well, you kind of need to at least be conversant with or be able to move through these, and these might be several steps that you take along the project. But um, um, I wanted to throw that in there. What's next? So this was somebody's ten steps to a pragmatic data pipeline. Uh, so where you move from uh, high volume up to velocity or variability up to variety and then through uh, that context, you do modeling um, and 
and inferability in them within these kind of the technologies, at least at the time that people were using. Um, okay, what are the next slide? This is the data science ecosystem, and we use several of these technologies. And this was kind of to the point, you know, for every use case, every problem you have, you need to probably come in here and find like the exact technology that you would want to use for that, you know, that one thing. Um, but uh, but uh, sometimes we generalize it. In fact, we use models. Okay, learn how to crunch the data power. I don't remember why that is on here, except that we're big R users. About the next slide. That's it, really. Summary of the steps. Uh, have a goal before you start. Uh, assess the skills and the data and the resources. Don't forget about using the good old scientific method because it's tried and true. Um, apply a little magic or hire somebody who can help with that and uh, ultimately tell a story because it's in, in that, you know, that you provide the value and you really sell what you're doing. So that's it. Any questions? Or Otherwise, I think um, we kind of wanted to end a little bit early, and so hopefully you get a chance to eat and socialize and network. But I think most of us are going over to the uh, Spark Meetup, <laughs> right? <laughs> right up the hill. Um, I don't know. What did you guys think? Did, is this kind of what you were hoping for? I, I definitely took a, a lot more of a, a business angle on um, on my approach to these pragmatic steps um, in the event that uh, Joel was going to bring out masses to this event, but uh, do you guys have any questions? Or? I think it's a good idea to put it, uh, the spin on the business side of it because that's your customer, that's what they're paying for. Yeah. And you're not, you're trying to solve a business problem, so. Yeah. But we definitely detect like that. So we just, yeah. <coughs> would you like to share more with you? So I can see that you, you really know what what you're doing. How long have you been doing these uh, consulting? Well, I've been a consultant for four years now, but I kept getting hired on full time. So I guess I wasn't really that long. But I, I went on the side. But I, uh, I, yeah, I've been a contractor and, and have had a contractor mentality um, for, a long, for a long time. And, and that's just how I approach. You know. And I think that's fine too. I'm not against you know, people who choose to work for a company that, um, but. Uh, but you do tend to see quite a few more uh, people that are checked out for sure. Can you explain a little bit more what are you going to teach in these two week uh, training? Oh, yeah, exactly. In fact, so we're, we're still trying to formulate it, but most likely it's um, it's going to be following, it's going to be R based this time. Um, we're going to be following uh, some of what Airbnb has published. And it's open source, so they use they do like a, a data science bootcamp. And if you remember, some of you might know that I taught a uh, Python-based bootcamp, and uh, it was a little bit before its time, and maybe didn't get the marketing that it needed. Um, but in this case, it, it actually is technology somewhat irrelevant. I just we just cannot find enough people that are comfortable around data, and and so a lot of it's just going to be like. We're actually going to get our hands dirty. You know, we're going to pull up databases and we're going to munch data like crazy. Uh, and so a lot of that's just declare and uh, and then we're going to get to visualization, right? Because it, I can apply the secret sauce in the middle. It's the ends that like you keep that yeah that keep things going and um, and make it all worthwhile. Um, and, and and it's amazing. I mean, businesses just can't find that. So. So that's the goal. Um, Can we talk about the kind of skills you need to get into it? Well, we're doing two. We're, we're doing the advanced one first uh, because hopefully we find somebody who will teach the beginner one, right? Because I don't have time to teach it. And then the beginner's one is going to be like, we'll take web developers. So, like, we, we just we desperately need people who can pretty much talk to a client and listen to what their business case is and then bring that back to the mothership and, and you know and then, and then help us push us through it and then and take it back and say to the executives vp level you know these are you know is this what you're looking for type of thing. 
you're trying to cover those two ends, right? Couple yeah. ends, yeah. Because uh, double up on it, really. Because I mean, we'll still do it, right? We just need more help. Exactly. But what I'm trying to say, you are not looking for data scientists per se. You're looking for not like the extreme, like um, well, you know, the, it's good. The deep learning. Yeah, we contract those. That's cool. it, because you know, I'm thinking about myself, for example. I have experience doing analysis for different kinds of systems, doing EDL. Yep. But I'm not, I mean, I understand basic statistics. That's exactly, yeah. yeah. I understand basic statistics, but I'm not a, yeah. I won't be crunching numbers. I mean, I, I, won't, I won't go to get a PhD on yeah. math or something like that, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, we don't necessarily need, like, sometimes I'll see ETL or data engineers that are kind of just like, Oh, I want to collect everything, or I want to just store it in my data warehouse. But they're a little bit naive to um, why they're doing it, or what, um, like what the end goal is. Um, yeah, which gets dangerous, especially in, in data warehousing, because then you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to index right, or you know, or you're going to make assumptions in how it's going to be queried that, uh, that could mess you up. So you need to be smart, like you do. But but at the same time, a lot of what we do too, it's schema on read, so. Struggle on the like we'll process it after the fact, right? Makes sense, Joe. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we do. Anyways, great questions, guys. I mean, I'll hang around for a little bit longer. I, I, uh, I really appreciate it that you came out, and this is uh, something that's fun for me. I love helping the community, and I learn a lot by, by doing this as well. Um, and hopefully, we can have more of these. Yes, yeah, so are you planning to do any Python based data science course? Yeah. Um, Where's so, your final integration? Yeah, the one that we did, uh, it, it, we, uh, it's not long. Yeah, we got material from, um, we licensed material, and so a large portion of the cost ended up being that license. And unfortunately, the material wasn't even that good. Um, and, um, I'll just be careful what I say. But um, the presenter was awesome, right? <laughs> no, I, I, I team taught it, and, and it was a little bit pricey. It's like $2,500 uh, for six weeks. But um, but there was a lot of value in it in the sense that um, I can look back on it and say the individuals that I wish would have been in it probably would have either saved their jobs or would have gotten the promotion if they wanted. Um, uh, but but in the end, um, it comes down to uh, like, how can I teach a course that um, adds more value than just like going to a plural site, right? Um, and some of that is the biggest value that I can provide is in in basically steering the the skills and the objective of it to exactly what I see my clients paying for. You know, and uh, and right now we have uh, uh, a client base that's a lot more on the R side. That's why I'm doing the R course, but I think that we'll probably do a, a more generic Python one. And so some of it just comes down to where can I get some decent material that um, you know makes it more efficient for me because because I'm not I'm not a teacher, you know, I'm a practitioner. Right. I'm a good practitioner. I'm a good practitioner, therefore I'm not a teacher, right? It's not the same that people who right. Yeah. yeah right. Where can I find the uh, the good resources if that happens? Oh if we do it. So I, I actually think that we're going to spin up another course with uh, district uh, gosh with uh, dev point labs at the beginning of the year. I think we're gonna do like a it'll probably be an immersion course or or maybe in the weekend during the week. And it's going to be full Python. That's the same, you know, same company we did it before. What time would it be? I don't know. Uh, uh, probably not. But it'll probably be. Uh, yeah, evenings. But but like it's not. It's not just a couple hours here and there. But to get into it, it's going to be six hours. Well, not per day. <laughs> like, like nine hours a week or something, right? It's going to not like a late. And probably for an extended period of time, like two or three months. Yeah. No, it's exact time. There are certainly a lot of resources out there, but hopefully, 
things like this can provide value in the sense that um, that we're definitely involved with the companies who have to share insights we have. So I'll take more questions all night. Thank you. Or if we're going to go to the Spark meetup, then I'll take the food home, I guess. Let's go. Hey, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I was in You like you like the most yeah, yeah. So, so it's like I did some I have some of that, but I have like so much to yeah. 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 It's like one big house and then they all the and then they all the time. So that's kind of the best thing. For me, I got the last one. So I'm saying it's very much the best one. Like, I got a guy that gets class done by his deadline, but it's less than what it is. And so I'm like, so I finally have more of a good example of what's going on now. 
I'm done. 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 I'm done
But it's it's not just an essay. They want they need someone that can be very cool. I think they need someone that both of them consistent with their charging. Maybe not watching the number that's more the same thing. I understand you want to understand the problem. Then you can present the solution. Oh, the old strategy there to not be more flat and so forth. Well, it's more like that. I mean, I guess we're going to stand in that day and not stand in the political basketball. This is not just any idea. It's 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 not just any idea. Well, that's it. I so it's I never set up I was actually, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I I saw it. I saw I saw I Thanks all. Oh, hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, good job. Yeah, the steeple's down. I don't know. 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 I don't know.
And what's cool about this kind of data space is not only does it work on operational kind of like you know inside the business, but it also is very helpful to marketing. You know, and how do you like craft the message in a way that inspires people to like buy your product, you know, or that it's working. Well, yeah, then, yeah, yeah, like we need to prove things. Sure. Exactly. Well, this being like data and then exactly. Exactly. Well, for a marketing sense, but then also kind of like, like a good variety. Right. 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 Were you seeing that? Yeah, we're in school district right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
about, uh, about that. And then also we can provide a lot of value to our customers, even if the clients like, um, well, like, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 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 And, and then solve for that component, but be able to move on to the spheres. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to ask you, I would you know what you want to bring Yeah. Some of the pieces in. Because right now it's like, and it's a lot of it's a lot of it's on the beginning right? yeah. and it's still will be custom, but it might still be. I mean, some of it might be custom. Well, that's perfect. That's that's really perfect for me because yeah, I like how much Prince do that. Yeah. And so if I'm trying to get ready for it, like do I need to practice? Oh, I'm gonna put out some stuff and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. we we're not there. You gotta be the best. You should be teaching me. We're doing this all. And then what I'm planning on doing too is so we're doing these two courses. I want to do another big conference, uh, probably in the beginning of the year, on kind of video storytelling and get some of the people out. Uh, there's a few like really good bloggers that use data that I want to uh, go on here. And then, yeah, they're in the valley already and we might buy something out. And so we're looking at how to sponsor that. But then uh, these two same courses, I'm looking at doing again in the high end in Provo. And oh. we'll probably do them indefinitely. So, you know, that would be nice. That makes sense. Right. Right. You, you will keep meeting people. Yes, yeah, so you want to keep yeah, them. And so, and so, like, yeah. And, and yeah, and so that in and of itself is a problem. Because I want it to be a little bit self sustaining, and that maybe it's also why I want to put a price tag on it. Um, because I want to, uh, want to hire that out and make sure that we just have a steady flow of. Like, I mean, all the time, there's, like, as soon as I go and work with a client, this is, this is like step number seven, or eight, right? As soon as you deliver, they say, okay, great, now we have you to fill it. We're going to hire you. But yeah, yeah, exactly. We have, like, 15 more of those, and uh, uh, <laughs> we need to hire you and everybody else to work with you. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that, that wow. has happened at least 80% of the time. Um, when you deliver value, and, and exactly. 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 if you don't deliver value, then they're like, oh my gosh, we're uh, paying too much for this. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And uh, hey, you're doing a property. Exactly. And so, and there's not enough. I, I just don't have, I mean, that's not what I would do, and, but I also just don't have enough people to say, like, that's great. You can have these people. Exactly. That's yeah. Right. So like you can have people. Yeah. Or you can have people. Or, you can have people that, or, or how about you just stick with us and keep doing it? Like a consulting partnership, um, but we're going to dedicate these resources. We're trying to have a lot of people that way. Yeah, yeah. Building up the resources. It's chicken and the egg, too. Because um, I mean, we're also still acting with close to deals, right? Like, I just got back to Canada like last month. You know, there's still like a hey, lot of things. I mean, kind of do you think it's obviously? Oh, it is. Oh, it is. Yeah, I'm not going to go to the next one. So, that's yeah, all that's yeah. another thing. So, all right, thanks a lot. Well, okay. See you guys. Yeah, you guys are great. Well, hopefully that's good. Hey, it was pretty good. I mean, I like that you keep putting simple and specific yeah. terms, and yeah. you gave many hints on the, on the way. Right. I mean, in this one, I, that's why they asked you how long that you read. So, I can see this every time. You have a good idea. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a young guy. So, uh, so, so, well, so why did you find out that you need to go? I did. I dropped out of the KG in computer science. And uh, I have a computer science engineering program. And after that, I took a job and I stayed there too long. And then, do either of you want some food? I'll take a, I'll stash one here. For tomorrow? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Look forward to uh, hearing more about what you're up to. I'm watching my emails and all the. I, I just followed the uh, Twitter, so. Oh, good. Right. Good, I'll try to put some more on there. Oh, yeah, or ask me anything. Um, yeah. Maybe you have a Python props. Yeah, I'll let you know. Okay, screw it. Yeah, oh, okay, absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do.
public houses. They have one street. And this place, like, wait, is it close here? Is it right across the street? Yeah. yeah. They are in um, Churchin State. Oh. Okay. You know what's my comfort now? What? Because I finished my drive. Oh. And then I'm, now I'm going to keep going. I didn't expect that I was expecting to keep going there. Yeah. So they got me with, with my savings. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of. Did you make room then? Yeah, so right now I'm in the point that. And that's why we focus on. on looking for the next one, right? More than the yeah. Even though I have it on networking, I have a really good focus. Yeah. And I'm feeling really close to the second half of the offer. So, um, so I've worked with. Uh, I've worked in there. And, um, so what do you think about that? Because one guy, he was one guy I met. He says he doesn't like the oh, business model. Name. He's a model. He's his name. His name is James. Their model company. No, no, the business model. He doesn't like. Oh, that. this model, of course. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. You know? It is. Yeah. He's almost like, like the church, right? He's also like kind of kind of treat the model. <laughs> Of course. He's like, you know, I remember in Mexico, when I went from Mexico, and, and I saw it in the software, they had ads that says, you need to have like two minimum salary and you can get a credit card. Yeah. <laughs> what is going to happen with that people? They give the credit to the people that, that doesn't know how to handle it and they're killing it. They're making a lot of money with the fees and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. So I want things like that, you know. So my friend didn't like that. He said, no, I don't Let's work with him. Uh, does he work there? Huh? No, 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 he did it. No, no, wait, no. I think he was working there. He's a local. But he has been doing some um, data analytics. I mean, data. Yeah. He actually started a company with them. Oh, well, James. And now he just left there. That's not helping. Oh, okay, you kind of look at the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna take a kid. Well, they take you car or something. But you know. It's maybe the only chance we have, we have to talk. No, no. I, Nick has been trying to get us together for a long time. I know, I know. The thing is, I, I don't have any doubt about it. I don't think I need to ask you Oh, yeah. But, oh. Oh, hang on. I need to. Um, there we go. I was recording this so I could share. Oh.